Peace be unto you from God, your heavenly Father, and from the Savior who defeated death and the grave for all of us, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The text for us to ponder for a few moments this morning are the last words of the 23rd Psalm, these familiar words, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Glenn Campbell is one of my favorite singers of all times. Of course, as many of you have commented, I do look a lot like him. And I'm sure we would all agree that when I sing, I sound a lot like him. I mean, we have that beautiful voice. My favorite Glenn Campbell song was his big hit, Galveston, which most people don't understand was about a soldier involved in some of the horrific battles of the Vietnam War. The song expresses how much the soldier misses the girl he left back home and the hope that he can return to Galveston and be with her again. Of course, Glenn had all kinds of other big hits too. Rhinestone Cowboy, Wichita Lineman, Try a Little Kindness, Southern Nights. All of those are great songs, but they're not the reason why I say Glenn Campbell is one of my favorite singers. He is one of my favorite singers because he had the courage to be open and very public about his battle with dementia, with Alzheimer's. And thus it was that Glenn and his family produced a documentary about his struggles. It was called I'll Be Me, and if you've never seen it, I actually would encourage you to do so. His family described the process of dealing with Glenn's dementia as the long goodbye. Quite honestly, that's a fitting name because as someone with dementia, as the months go by, you're always saying goodbye to another part of your loved one's personality and memories. You just keep saying goodbye to more and more of your loved one until pretty much the only thing left is their body. And soon that's gone too. Others have called this process the slow funeral. The last song Glenn ever sang publicly in front of an audience describes what dementia was like to him. The song was called, I'm Not Going to Miss You. It was written to his wife, but I think we can learn something from it. Here's part of what he's saying. I'm still here, but yet I'm gone. I don't play guitar or sing my songs. They never defined who I am, the man that loves you till the end. You're the last person I will love. You're the last face I will recall. And best of all, I'm not going to miss you. I'm not going to miss you. Glenn wouldn't miss his wife because he knew that finally her memory would be erased from his mind too. Just imagine for a moment how hard that would be to see that going on within yourself and to know there's nothing you can do about it. My dad had Alzheimer's too. And for him, the hardest times were when his mind was working right. And he knew that soon he would not remember anyone anymore. So, so what kept Glenn Campbell going as he dealt with this horrible disease? What kept him going? Well, he answered that question in one of the last songs he ever sang. It wasn't the very last, but it was next to it. The song was called A Better Place. Here's some of the lyrics. 
I've tried and I've failed, Lord. I've won and I've lost. I've lived and I've loved. Oh, sometimes at such a cost. One thing I know, the world is good to me. A better place awaits you, you see. Some days I'm so confused, Lord, my past gets in the way. I need the ones that I love most to hold me more each day. Oh, a better place. You see, what kept Glenn Campbell going through the darkness and the confusion was his faith, his belief that Alzheimer's was just a temporary condition and that soon he would come to a better place, a better place where there would be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, a better place where never again will we hunger and never again will we thirst and where the sun will not beat on us or any scorching heat, a better place where the old order of things is done away with once and for all. A better place that truly would be better by far. You see, that's the hope that sustained Glenn Campbell in his battle, my friends. And that's the hope that I saw in my dad. And that's the hope that sustained William Bill Rocket. We are gathered here in honor and memory of today. Now, I must tell you, my friends, my friend Bill had an incredible faith in God and in God's promises. He was absolutely convinced that that better place awaited him. Once many years ago, when Bill was facing his first cancer surgery, the doctor told him that he had only a 50% chance of surviving the surgery. And quite honestly, the doctor got concerned when Bill stayed so calm and kept a smile on his face. He, he got concerned that maybe Bill didn't understand what was going on. And so the doctor said something like, you do understand that you might die. And Bill told the doctor, there's something you don't understand. I'm in a win-win situation. Either the surgery will go well and I'll get to stay with my wife and family or it will not go well and I'll get to be with Jesus. Either way, I win. And quite honestly, that was Bill's basic attitude toward life. Because of Jesus, he knew ultimately he couldn't lose. He was always in a win-win situation. It's interesting, when Erin Seip found out she had cancel, cancer, she came to him once and asked him how he had maintained that positive attitude through all the hard and scary times he had endured. And once again, he told her the same thing. He was in a win-win situation. Either he would be cured and he'd get to be with his family and friends longer or else he'd go home to be with Jesus. Either way, he would win. See, Bill knew that a better place awaited him. And that's exactly what sustained him through cancers and surgeries and type 2 diabetes and amputations and dementia and everything else. He knew a better place awaited him. He believed what David confessed in the words of the 23rd Psalm. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Bill knew that heaven would be his eternal home. And that's what I'd like you to remember today. Just remember where Bill is even now. And what his new life is like there. Because now Bill has won the ultimate victory. And he is with Jesus in the glory of heaven. And think about it. He's been reunited with all his friends and loved ones who went before him in the faith. He's been reunited with his parents and Emma Jean and Marilyn and Clarence and Casey and so many other people that he loved. Bill now is with Jesus in heaven. And that means he no longer suffers from confusion or dementia. He no longer has diabetes. He no longer has a cancer-damaged body. No, he has been healed. He has been cured. He is absolutely well. That's where Bill is even now. But how do we know that for sure? How can we be certain of that? And how did Bill know, really know, that he would, in fact, go to a better place? Well, I got two main answers for that. 
The first one has to do with that last reading that you heard. That last reading was from Bill's confirmation certificate. Talked about the resurrection of Jesus. And quite honestly, that's the main reason why we know that there is life after death. Because Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. He came back from the dead. And my friends, that's not just a story. That is fact. He appeared again and again and again over a 40-day period to all kinds of people. In fact, at one point, he appeared to a crowd of some 500 people, most of whom were still alive when Paul was writing his letters that make up his books in our, our Bible. You see, no one could dispute the resurrection back then because there were all those eyewitnesses. So yes, we do know that there is life after death because of Easter, because of the empty tomb, because of the resurrection of Jesus. But second, we know that there is life after death for Bill in heaven because Jesus made us that promise. I mean, you heard part of the promise in the liturgy we spoke together. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never truly die. See, that's the promise Jesus made to us again and again and again. I mean, you heard that same promise in the much-loved, familiar words of John 3, 16. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him would not perish but would have eternal life. And of course, that's the promise that we just heard in that text from the 23rd Psalm. And I will note confidence and certainty, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That, my friends, is the promise of Jesus. And Jesus always keeps his promises. He never goes back on his word. Jesus promised that everyone who looked to him in faith would live even though they died. They would live with him. And that's how we know that Bill is indeed in heaven even now. Because Bill was a believer in Jesus Christ. Bill believed in Jesus Christ as the Savior. I mean, you certainly saw that for yourself. You could see Bill's faith in his upbringing. Bill was blessed to have two strong Christian parents, and they made sure that he grew up knowing Jesus Christ in faith. So they made sure he was baptized. In fact, he got baptized by his uncle, Fred Rocket, and a, a Missouri Synod pastor. And you know what? They made sure that Bill went to church and Sunday school every Sunday. And they did catechism classes and got confirmed. They made sure that he was involved in the Walther League and helped with the work of the church. It's interesting, Bill actually helped clean off the bricks from our first fire here back in 1950. I remember him telling me that story. So Bill most certainly knew Jesus Christ in his childhood days. And from the way that Bill and Shirley raised their three daughters, too, you can see his faith. Because Bill and Shirley raised their daughters to know Jesus Christ, so they made sure they were baptized and they went to church and Sunday school each Sunday. They made sure they were confirmed and were involved in youth group. And most nights, Bill went in and would say those evening prayers, those good night prayers with his daughters. See, he wanted to make sure they grew up knowing Jesus Christ too. That shows his faith. And certainly you could see Bill's faith in the spiritual habits he maintained throughout his life. For Bill continued to go to church every Sunday. In fact, I, I will tell you, there's a pew that used to have the, his name engraved underneath. Then the fire happened. I'm pretty sure I saw him trying to carve his name in the new pew there. But he sat in the exact same, right? exact same spot every time. That was his pew. He'd share it with you if you accidentally sat there, but... Uh, that was his pew, and Sunday after Sunday, he sat there. And he went to Sunday school, the adult Bible study class, every Sunday. And he even went to midweek Bible study classes, too. He had those strong spiritual habits. And he continued to study his Bible on his own, and he was a man who was truly faithful in prayer. That was his ongoing life. And Bill did more 
than just go to church to be fed. He also devoted himself to helping with the work of God's church. Over the years, Bill served in all kinds of ways here at St. John's, as an elder, an usher, as the Sunday school treasurer, and as the congregational treasurer, as a member of Lutheran Layman's League and the Couples Club and uh, Golden Nuggets and on and on and on. Actually, one of the things that Bill loved to do as a service to the church was to visit the other members of the church when they were in the hospital or in a nursing home. He really enjoyed going to encourage them. Plus, Bill, as you heard, helped for decades with the work going on at Camp Linhaven as they sought to help people grow in their relationship with Christ. He actually started serving there as a teenager, washing dishes. And he continued to help there for decade after decade after decade. You'd see him driving around in that golf cart a lot, fixing things and taking care of things, whatever needed to be done. So yes, you could definitely see Bill's faith in his spiritual habits. And certainly you could see Bill's faith and love that he had for others. I mean, there's no doubt about how much Bill loved Shirley. The two of them were married 60 years. And I'll tell you what, you could see Christ's love in the love they shared with each other and the way they cared for each other. And Bill loved his daughters. You truly were precious to him. And he loved his grandchildren. He used to brag about you to me when I'd come and talk to him. And I got to tell you, he really had a strong love for his great-grandchildren. Anytime he could see one, put a smile on his face. And you know what? He even loved his in-laws. I'm shocked. <laughs> Bill and Kim and Kevin and their families meant the world to him. You could see Christ's love in the way Bill loved his family. But Bill's love for others was not limited to just family. I guess you could see that by the number of people that are here today. Bill seemed to share Christ's love with just about everybody God brought into his life. I mean, you could see Christ's love in the way he treated his customers in the plumbing business. Bill had a lot of widows as customers, and oftentimes, if he knew they were on limited means, he would not charge them for labor. He would just charge them for the parts he needed to make the repairs. And he did the same thing for nonprofits like churches and the corner table or, or Camp Linhaven. One time there was a desperately poor widow whose water heater died. Now, of course, everyone needs a working water heater, so Bill put one in for her and told her she could pay what she could when she could. And so she did. She sent in $10 a month. But you know, when that Christmas came along, Bill returned her bill to her mark paid in full. And told her she didn't have to pay anymore. That's the kind of love. Bill had for others. And Bill had an especial soft spot for children. I'll tell you what, he loved the children here at church. He was always bringing gum to give to them. And he loved the children up at Camp Linhaven that he'd get to spend time with. And Bill had a unique habit. You see, he was a coin collector. And what he loved to do is give to the children that God brought into his life a 50 cent piece, a half dollar. Very few young people have even seen those. You don't get those much in change anymore. In fact, he gave some to his fellow members of the Golden Nuggets, that senior citizens group. He even gave a couple to me, and he gave me a, a buffalo nickel once, too. So. Um, but Bill's generosity and kindness for the little ones certainly was an expression of his faith in the Lord Jesus as well. So yes, you could see Bill's faith in Jesus and the love that he had for others. But quite honestly, I would guess the most beautiful, profound way you could see Bill's faith was in the way he endured hardship. Now, I already told you about his win-win comment, but I want you to know that Bill kept that smile on his face through all the crap that life threw at him. He kept his smile and a calm disposition and a heart full of love for others, no matter what he was going through. And we know that only faith in Christ can produce that kind of behavior in a person. I got together with Bill's grandson, Luke, a fellow pastor, and we were talking one morning this week about this remarkable trait. 
And Luke shared something really profound with me. And I asked him to write it down. And I'm going to share that with you. So the words that are about to come up, these are Luke's words. Bill knew what it meant to be a theologian of the cross. For Bill understood that pain, suffering, hardship, tragedy, and trials, that the everyday crosses that we bear are simply the thorns connected to this beautiful rose we call life. Bill was no stranger to suffering. He was a two-time cancer survivor. He fought diabetes and dementia. And yet he never ceased to be full of joy, hope, and faith in a God who was and is so much bigger than his problems. There's a Latin text and phrase called, and I'm not going to pronounce this right, uh, Luke, so I'm sorry. Uh, Ars Moriandi, which translates the art of dying. And Bill demonstrated the art of dying better than anyone I have ever known. Because the art of dying is actually the art of living in the faith. To see suffering, hardship, pain, and even death, and to see it as a gift, as a win, as simply the thorn on the most beautiful rose of all, as the entrance to the resurrection. Bill understood that he was united to the cross of Christ in the waters of baptism, that his suffering, pain, and hardship were united to the sufferings of Christ himself, and that in his death he too would be united to Christ's resurrection. Bill lived out the art of dying each and every day because he lived each and every day in faith. He lived each day thankful for the blessing and the beauty of life in the here and now, and yet always looking to the life that is to come. For Bill, death was not the end of his good story. It was only the beginning of life everlasting in the presence of Jesus Christ as Lord. And that's why Bill excelled in the art of dying because he never stopped looking and pointing to the one who died in his place, Jesus is Lord and Savior. Unquote. So yeah, I got nothing to add to that. You clearly could see Bill's faith and the way he handled suffering. So in all these ways and more then, that's why we know that Bill, even now, is with his Savior Jesus in heaven. That's why we know even now that Bill has now arrived at that better place he was looking forward to. And I hope you'll focus on that truth whenever you miss Bill. Just remember, he is not dead. He is alive, more alive than ever, alive and well with Jesus, alive and healed with Jesus. He now lives even though he has died thanks to his faith in Jesus Remember, one day you can see him again. May this knowledge give you peace and joy and strength, even as you grieve his temporary loss from your life. In Christ's name, amen.